Well, we're back together, uh, Daryl Balls and Chris Pedersen and myself, uh, to talk about your questions that came out of a September 23rd AAII presentation. And that presentation was focused on uh, the, we called it the best. Really, it was, a, it was a comparison of 11, many of them very popular uh, small portfolios where uh, it, it, they were from one, two, three to four funds in the portfolio. So it was really focused on trying to help people who are looking for a way to get the best returns that they can, but with fewer holdings. And, uh, uh, and, and we had a great turnout. We ended up with over 75 questions that uh, we hadn't answered uh, that the night of, that, uh, of the presentation. And we're not going to get to all of them. Uh, we've tried to kind of lump them together in uh, the, the two uh, uh, podcasts we've done in the last uh, week and, and, uh, or a couple weeks. And so we're going to do that again. We're going to try to move a little faster. Daryl says he doesn't have any more of those big tables. I'm sorry, you're disappointed. I think if you when you hear that, but no uh, we're going to we're going to move along and uh, hope that this is helpful. Um, I got a question, and and some of these is possible we answered before. Here's an easy one for me. And what was the return of the ultimate? buy and hold portfolio during the 1990 through 2019 period. The reason people might be asking that is because we do have those returns going back to 1970. And you can see those on our, on, on our website, uh, but we didn't break them out or make that part of the presentation because there are 10 different asset classes in that portfolio. And the ultimate buy and hold strategy is either 50% international or 30% international, which means that would be a drag on performance as we've already learned when we look at other uh, portfolios that have international. So how did it do? Very similar kinds of return. 8.9%, that's a little better than, than uh, some of the others, but uh, for the 50-50, and just by changing it to 70-30 for exactly the same asset classes, it was 10.1%. So that's a big, that's, that's a big improvement, uh, and that's because the U.S. securities did so well during uh, that period of time. I want to go on. We had a lot of questions about internationals, adding those. We've, we've, we've talked about that. Daryl, I've got to ask you, uh, are you going to be doing some more work on these, these portfolios, building these portfolios similar to the U.S. only four fund strategy that we've done? Are you working on anything in terms of the uh, uh, adding the internationals? Well, the, yeah, the, part of the reason why we chose them or why we ended up using the 90 to 2019 time period was because uh, I wanted to use a consistent set of, of, of source, a consistent source for all the data. So we ended up using dimensional indexes for all the data, data classes, all the, all the asset classes. One of the other things we can do is go back and look at to 1970 using the asset classes that we use for the ultimate buy and hold. Chris has taken an effort over the last several months, many months here, to try to, to see if we can push back the frontier on how long we have some of those asset classes into the background. And now that that's complete, we can go ahead and push some of those, those analyses back another 20 years to the 1970 timeframe. So that will be on the docket to do. Okay, that's great. Uh, and by the way, Chris, any, anything on your uh, October 21 presentation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about some results from 1970 on, including internationals. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how we got there. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Paul has mentioned in other podcasts that he uses momentum and relative strength strategies in the past. 
Um, I am often asked about market timing. And the answer is, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't, I love talking about market timing. But one, it starts to, to, to sound like something that people should try to do on their own. And I really do not recommend people do market timing on their own, even for a small part of their portfolio. But yes, in my portfolio, I'm half in market timing, but I don't do the market timing. There's no way I would maintain that discipline if I were trying to do that on my own. So, uh, but I will say that DFA, in fact, one of you may want to comment on this. DFA, in a way, uses a little bit of market timing themselves. Anybody want to talk about how they do that? Well, I, I was going to just chime in and clarify. This is always really important. When people think about market timing, I think most people think, oh, I'm, you're, you're going to come up with some crystal ball way to know when to be in the market when it goes up and out of the market when it goes down. And that's going to give me a higher return. And that's absolutely not what you do. You do systematic trend following that follows rules and it's done by somebody else for you. And you're not trying to beat the market. Essentially, you're putting brakes on when the market's already going down mm -hmm. and you're expecting to give up some return for it. Um, but get some reduction in the volatility, right? So in some respects, it's a risk reducing strategy that you're using where when most people think about market timing, I think they're thinking it's a, a performance enhancing strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that what DFA does is systematic as well, right? They, they try to be uh, rules-based and not, they're not making judgments about the market, whether it's going up and down based on either intuition or even some magic, magic analysis they have. Um, they're, they're simply, uh, you know, applying the same kinds of principles, aren't they, that you're applying? Well, I know they use momentum, I know, in, in some of their, of their work. And, uh, um, and, and like any timer, uh, they've studied it and feel like it gives some advantage. The problem is we've talked here about how difficult it is to be out of sync with the market by adding uh, value, uh, uh, whether it be small or large. And uh, the reason that we think people may not want to do that is because they're going to have to look different than the market and that's uncomfortable. Well, if you're uncomfortable with that, timing is twice as difficult because I can almost guarantee, not totally, but almost, that when you use timing, you're going to underperform the return of buy and hold in a big bull market. Because every, almost every big bull market has a period it comes down from a top. And when it comes down from a top, your trend following systems kick you out. And so you go to cash, and then when, the, when it turns around and goes back up, you're going to get back in again, never at the bottom, when the trend has changed. Well, in that process of getting in and getting out in a big bull market, typically you're going to take a portion of that return and you're going to miss it on the way up. And so at the end of the year, you look at the market timing part of your portfolio and remember the market goes up two out of three or more years. And so it means that you should expect to underperform the market about one third of the years because you believe as a market timer that you're going to protect against a major market decline. Is it possible that the way the market comes down, that it whipsaws you on the way down and you don't protect as well as you thought you were going to? Absolutely. I mean, that's the, that's the challenge of investing. There's a risk. There's a risk in the success of equities. There's a risk in the success of patterns of, of how equity markets move. So you could, in fact, in fact, people often think that if you have a good market timer, they're going to make you money in a year that the market goes down. No, they would hopefully lose you less. That is, that is what you're working to do is to minimize the losses, but no market timer knows how to eliminate uh, losses. So 
all of those hurdles that you have to get over with value and small, they even get worse with timing because you're not going to make money in a, in a bear market. Ah, sometimes you do. 1987, an amazing year for market timing. We had a, a, accounts that are up about 50% because of market timing. So we, we, we know it can happen, but we don't depend on it. And so timing is not dependable as the, as the brain wants it to be. So uh, sorry to go on and on about timing. As you can tell, it's something I don't like to talk about. <laughs> I actually love talking about it. Um, I have 10 years left. Now you stop me, Chris, if we've done this before. Would two funds for life be the best strategy if I'm 10 years away from retirement? I'd encourage people to watch my presentation on the 21st. Oh, right. uh, but I'll, yeah. I'll just say for the listeners here, uh, yes, I would. Um, you know, if you think about it, 10 years before retirement, it means you're putting a little bit into small cap value uh, and you're ramping it down as you get closer to retirement. And all of my modeling says that it, it improves your likely outcomes. It doesn't hurt. Um, I, now, it, that's historical. No guarantees about the future. But uh, it, it uh, also, I think, gives people a chance to get some experience in a small way with this asset class that provides them added diversification and may be useful in retirement as well. Because once people get comfortable that their cash flow is solid in retirement and that they, they know how to live off their savings prudently, uh, some people realize they have more saved than they need and they wonder, well, what can I do to invest for the next generation? And so that experience they have leading up to retirement may give them the confidence then into retirement to start taking a portion of their uh, allocation and putting it into small or value or both uh, and be able to leave a little bit more to their heirs or, um, you know, live a little bit richer lifestyle in the long run. So, yeah, I, I think it's still useful and, and uh, a good idea, even 10 years from retirement. And, and, you know, for young people who use a strategy like you've developed with the two funds or, or Daryl, the work that you've done with the four fund combo, uh, if those are applied over a lifetime, 40, 45, 50 years, and a lot of young people today who are starting to work at 21, it's not going to be a shock if they're still working at 70. Uh, just that is the direction that our society seems to be, uh, to be moving, that people are going to be working longer. If they've done the right things, they're going to end up with more money in, 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 their, in their portfolio. They're going to have the ability to take more risk when they're in retirement. And th this is the part that's interesting about the planning that you do and, and making that decision, how much risk you're going to take when you're young, because if all those dreams, uh, when I say dreams, all that past performance, if it happens again, the additional amount of money you're going to have, even with just using a modest addition of small cap value, for example, you don't have to be a, aggressive, could mean you're going to end up with 20, 30, 40% more when you retire. Have I overstated the case, Chris? No, no. I, I, you know, uh, in the last podcast, we talked about safe withdrawal rates and Daryl pointed out that uh, for, I think uh, the median safe withdrawal rate was something like 8% on uh, an S&P 500 or a four fund for life. They were both kind of in that 8% range. What that says is that most retirees, if they follow a 4% or 3.5% safe withdrawal rate, halfway through their retirement are going to realize that they're, you know, they're likely to be part of the half that uh, does better than average. So um, safe withdrawal rates are conservative intentionally. And that means not that we should ignore them, but that a lot of people will die with a lot of money. A lot of people will be in a position to be charitable um, or help their children. Right. And so uh, yeah, I, I think um, 
I, I like the Craig Israelson quote, uh, quote when he's going through this and he's looking at all these different histories. He says, can we all just take a breath and relax a little bit? Um, the safe withdrawal rates are conservative for a reason. We don't want people to take too much risk and run out of money. But that conservatism means that a lot of people are going to end up with some extra. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. Daryl, you want to you wanna say anything, add anything there at all? Huh? Yeah, the only thing, well, there are two things I guess I would add, is that uh, Chris is absolutely right. The, the, the sustainable or safe withdrawal rate studies, um, when you look at the number that comes out of that, 4%-ish or so most of the time, people think that when the things are, are sort of like they are now looking forward, that that means that, that this is really bad and this is as bad as it's ever been and you know, the 4% might not be safe. Well, the, four, what the, the environment or the economy that set the 4% rate was no picnic either. It and was so, the worst. <laughs> it, well, it, it maybe, you know, it's hard to say. Um, well, it was the worst that was in that historical sequence. Yes, it was. And that's the point. It's the worst that has ever happened in that historical sequence for the last 90 years or so. But that's, that was the worst 30 year sustainable withdrawal rate that happened. Could the future be worse? Sure. Is it likely to be worse than that? I'd say no. Am I, am I, am I guaranteeing that? No, but, but it's, it's likely the 4% will survive. The other thing I would just comment on Chris is kind of, you use the future tense. And when we were talking about safe withdrawal rates, and I don't think you could do that. And I yeah. don't, and I know you don't, I know you know correction. that, but, but I just wanted to make sure that we don't get a lot of grief about saying that we're, we're talking about what will happen in the future. And what we're really doing is looking at what's happened in the past and we're, we're making judgments about whether that's reasonable to expect for the future. Good. I was thinking about turning Chris into the SEC for having made that comment. <laughs> yeah, get, call the compliance uh, officer on me. I'm just trying to keep you out of jail, Chris. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's one. Love your work, but aimed at 20 to 30-year-olds. What do you recommend for 50 to 55 who want to retire now? Assets of $3 million. How do you think, what, how, how do you approach investing? differently when you are when you're in your 50s you got more money maybe than you need although we don't know what this person's cost of living is but how does it change your thinking about how you approach your money for the rest of your life and uh chris says you're the youngest of the three of us and since you recently retired how different do you think that state of mind is for a younger person versus somebody who might be facing retirement at the late 60s or 70s? Well, obviously we don't uh, have a boilerplate recommendation for somebody based on so little information, right? Um, yep. What we tend to do is offer people education and a lot of options and things that they can uh, use to find what's best for them. So I would encourage somebody who's approaching retirement to study your website, look at the different portfolio options, look at the different drawdowns that a, diff that, that a uh, fixed income equity mix for the different portfolios is going to lead to and how bumpy that ride is going to be. Think about how you, what they can tolerate. Think, think of how they're going to lose sleep, right? Are they going to lose sleep with a 50% drawdown, a 30% drawdown, a 20% drawdown? Um, so that, that would be step one. Uh, step two, if they can't find something that they're confident in, if they're still doubting that they're going to get to enough savings to have a reasonable safe withdrawal rate, I would say talk to a planner, right? Definitely. I, as, as deep as I am into all of this, and as much as I like it, we talked to a planner. Um, I just wanted that confidence going into retirement that somebody independent um, who was prudent had looked at our plans and said we'd be okay. And um, it, it, 
it provided a very large amount of comfort that we were on the right track. We were doing the right thing. And um, it was important. They were a fiduciary. I chose somebody who could provide access to DFA funds if we decided that we wanted to stick with them. Those were important qualities to us. We didn't. We ended up going it on our own. And the, one of the last questions I asked them was, do you think we'll be okay doing it on our own? And, and uh, they did. So, you know, that, but you have to figure out what's going to work for you personally. I think that period of time, though, coming up to retirement is particularly ripe for getting that kind of an independent check, a gut check of, of how you're doing. If you don't need it, though, you know, if you look at the website and you figure it out and you figure out an investment plan that you can stick with, great. You're, you're probably fine. I, I have to, uh, the emotional aspects are, are so different from one person to another, which is one of the reasons why it's very difficult for teachers <laughs> to be able, you're not sitting with the, the, the student to give advice. But when I hear Daryl talking about a safe withdrawal for 30 years now, I'm 70, almost 77. So 30 years, is a short, I mean, that's, that's way more than I need. But my immediate reaction is, oh, no, no, I don't want to think 30. I want something that will last for 100 years. <laughs> well, what's that about? My wife would ask that question too. <laughs> why don't you want to spend more? I don't know. I can't tell you why. I can't just wing it and, and not worry about that. But those are emotions that Many people deal with it have nothing to do with the tables on our website, and they need somebody to kind of walk them through that. And for people like myself who are really frugal by nature, uh, when the market's going down, even though I've got plenty for the next 30 years, I, I still have that gnawing feeling like there's something bad going on here. And those are difficult things for a lot of us. It must be some sort of scarcity issues. Daryl, have you found a magic way to deal with these kinds of uh, challenges? Uh, well, from a personal standpoint, I I don't know. Maybe I'm just clueless, but I don't I don't actually pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the market. When we had this crash earlier this year. Um, I don't think it occurred to me to really pay much attention to what was going on until I thought, well, there's been a lot of bad news. Maybe I ought to see if I ought to rebalance. And so I went and looked and, and things were down quite a bit. It didn't really bother me much. And it turns out I didn't really need to rebalance either. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that tells me, but uh, other than the fact that, that if you set yourself up in a reasonable way, which I think we've done, you're fairly you're on a fairly even keel and, and you don't necessarily need to get blown around by the winds of the market. Um, the other thing I would say, and kind of back to the original question is that as you get closer to, to retirement um, and you're worried more about the, the, the swings, one of the things that you can remember is take or remember when you're thinking about this is, is that um, your asset allocation between fixed income and, and equity as, it's, as far as its impact on your safe withdrawal rate goes, anytime you have equities between about 30 and 70% of your portfolio, it's not going to affect your safe withdrawal rate that much. It affects a little bit, but we're talking a few, few tenths of percent is what we're talking about here, less than half a percent probably. And so it's, it's important, as Chris mentioned, to go back and look at those fine tuning tables and to look at whatever portfolio you've chosen to look at, whether it's the poor fund or the ultimate buy and hold or something else, and see how that volatility and drawdowns change from a 30% equity or 30% fixed income to a 70% fixed income and see what that looks like compared to what your withdrawal rate might be, how that vary a little bit, and, and think about maybe beginning to pull back on the equities as you glide into uh, retirement. And then once you're through retirement a little bit, if you feel comfortable with it, you can move it back to the high side of 70% say to just sort of scoot through that, that maximum exposure to sequence of return risk. You know, uh, we have got a lot of questions about uh, fixed income and uh, it's almost like how, how can you, 
how can you own fixed income today? It doesn't give you any income. And uh, uh, that's a dilemma for people. In fact, you can almost smell that with the market. People are, who have money coming in are not choosing to put it in fixed income because there's, they know there's no reward for them. Uh, and so how do you counsel somebody if you, if you wanted to? Uh, to deal with the fact that fixed income doesn't doesn't pay anything. It's uh, there's no premium uh, for for having your money there, and and in fact may even end up being less than you would uh, uh, inflation you might have. How do you how do you respond? You want to take it, Chris? I'm not sure if I want to take it or not, but two thoughts come to mind. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the first is that I have no idea where things will go in the future, right? I, I don't know where fixed income returns will be in the future. So uh, it could be that this zero interest rate environment that we're in stays around and, and fixed income doesn't have much of an upside. Uh, it could be, it goes the other way. I don't know. Um, that's definitely not my area of expertise. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure anybody outside knows either, right? Uh, so that's step one. And then the second thought is that neither the brakes in my car or the seat belt or the airbag, none of the three make my car go any faster. But I still want all three, <laughs> yeah, right? Great. And the reason we have the fixed income in the portfolio isn't that it's a fantastic engine. It's that it's a, a, a safety mechanism, right? I love what Daryl just said about the, uh, I didn't know that, that the safe withdrawal rates vary so little based on the fixed income amount. If you have it between 30 and, uh, 30 and 70% of uh, equities, right? So- uh, you know, Back to Bengen, huh? Yeah, back I'm to Bengen. This is, this is Bill Bengen's work. And right, yeah. So here, that here is- yeah. yeah, that is a fantastic observation. And it helps, I think it helps cut, uh, people also relax about the idea that maybe their allocation isn't perfect, right? It's like if you're in the ballpark, if you have some amount of fixed income that's meaningful, that's going to give you the protection you need probably. Yeah. Great. All right. Uh, Government employees use the thrift savings plan for retirement. Do you think their life cycle funds make sense? Well, of course, life cycle funds are target date funds. Right. And uh, just got a minute for that, Chris, since you're yeah, the I, target I, date fund expert. I have a son-in-law who's in the military, and I'm very happy that he has access to the TSP investments because they are very low cost. The government drives a good deal, right? They, they don't always drive a good deal. But in this case, the investments are very economical. The expense rates are low. Uh, and I think the two fund for life strategies applied using those life cycle funds is a great idea for uh, for. Uh, Anybody who's got access to the TSP life cycle funds. Yeah, they are basically target date funds. And they have a small cap fund. Yep. So that's what you would use uh, to go along with the target date fund? I probably would. Although if I were, uh, you know, if I were advising my son-in-law and he asked me this question, um, I would encourage him to also think about, the 90-10 strategy where you take 90% of what's going into your thrift savings plan account, well, 90% of what you're going to save every month. And we'll say that that's in your thrift savings plan life cycle fund. And then outside of that fund, take 10% of your savings and put it into a small cap value fund that you couldn't get within the other account. And, um, I think that that would give you uh, more exposure to the factors and give you a better chance at getting a higher return over the long run. Um, it also gives you eh, this potential that your risk goes up over time because you're not rebalancing between the two, but it's not that great. Um, you know, I've, I've modeled that. It's up on the website. It increases it nearing retirement by a few percent. It's not, it's not dramatic. 
Um, so either way, yeah, you could use the small, just the small blend fund that's available within the TSP, or you could use a second account externally and just put, you know, ideally extra money, save even more <laughs> into, into an a IRA, value a Roth fund. IRA if you can. Uh, if you could do a Roth on top of that, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Strategies, do any of the, of the strategies that uh, we're talking about have equal weighted index funds? I don't know that we talked about this one before. Um, anybody want to talk about the equal weighted uh, index funds and, and how that relates to the kind of thing that's, that's recommended with the four fund strategy, which is another kind of weighting uh, in terms of building a portfolio. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of the indexes, Daryl, use are equal weighted funds in the sense that they own, you know, an equal percentage of every asset in the account. That's usually what it means. Um, Daryl's made the point that in a sense, the portfolio, the four fund portfolio shifts you in the direction of equally weighting the asset classes, which is true. It equally weights large blend, large value, small blend, small value, um, but it's more tax efficient because within each of those, they're, uh, they're able to wait and not have to trade every time the market cap of a company changes a little bit. Within an equal weighted fund, every time the market caps change, um, they don't have to do it every day, but periodically I have to go in and trade everything to adjust, right? Yeah. So there's a trading cost to an equal weighted fund that's not, not in there too, which is good. So let me ask you too, because we get a lot of questions about, about rebalancing. In the equity part of our portfolio, and I'm thinking about young people to start with, and then we can talk about old people too. Uh, do you really in the equity part have to be rebalancing every year or every every two years. Uh, have you looked at the, at the impact of just staying the course, whether it's with four different asset classes or, or more uh, and, and not rebalancing? Any, any thoughts on that? Or do we just want to assume everybody should rebalance periodically? I think it depends on, on your risk posture. Um, to me, the reason you rebalance is to maintain your risk, uh, a risk level that you're comfortable with. Um, if, you, if you are comfortable with the drawdowns and the volatility and all the other things you see with a 60-40 portfolio, then if you get creeping more towards a 70-30 or a 50-50 portfolio, you would want to shift back to 60-40 because there's probably a reason you didn't pick 70-30 or 50-50 to begin with. So if you start to get close to one of those, you should come back. On the other hand, um, when you're young, I think it doesn't, you, you should be, I believe personally, you should be taking more risk, as much risk as you, as you can early because it will benefit you in the long run. So what happens is if you don't balance when you're young, your, your portfolio will drift towards the, re, towards the assets that have higher expected returns over time. And, uh, and that will in, maybe possibly increase your risk in terms of standard deviation and drawdowns. Um, but that's probably okay when you're young. I know young people have a hard time with this because they, they typically don't invest a large chunk of their readily available cash in equities. But I believe that it would be a good thing to do. I was fortunate because I was dumb when I was young and I didn't know any better. And I had everything in 100% equities for probably 25 years before I somebody explained to me that somebody like this guy over here explained to me that maybe that's not a good idea anymore. Oh, maybe not. Okay. So, so I lucked into it, but I think that it's a good thing um, to not be too concerned with getting too out of whack on rebalancing when you're young. Chris, what do you think? I, I agree. I agree. Um, 
And in the studies I've done, the difference between monthly, quarterly, and yearly rebalancing is is very minor. It's uh, you know tens of basis points, tenths of a percent. Um, so yeah, I I think for most people, uh, a year a yearly goal is good, and if you don't get to it in two, you're probably still all right. You know, it's yeah. I, I know Daryl, you you use limits, right? You mentioned that earlier in this mm-hmm. podcast series, uh, and I think that's a fine way to go too. You can, uh, if you look at your portfolio and everything's within a percent or two. And, you know, there's no reason to feel obligated to rebalance at that point in time. You could wait. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I look at it as a risk management strategy. I don't look right. at it as how it affects returns because it doesn't a whole lot. I look more at it, how it, how it manages my risks. How does it do? I, am I drifting towards a portfolio that's going to have a much sharper drawdown than maybe I'm comfortable for? If that's the case, I need to move back. Where can I get a copy of we're talking millions? That is one of the questions that we got, and that is the book that's coming out in, uh, I'm guessing, the very first part of December. Uh, if you become a subscriber at the exorbitant price, and I'm talking about our newsletter, where the three of us, in whatever free time we have in our life as retirees, uh, whatever we can do to help you, we're working on that stuff. And, um, and, and, and so if you subscribe to our newsletter at a cost of zero, uh, as a matter of fact, when you sign up for the newsletter, if you wanted to, you could also choose one of uh, three eBooks that are there, or you could actually take them all. They're there to try to help people. One for first time investors, One's about 101 investment decisions guaranteed to change your financial future. And the third one uh, is entitled uh, Get Smart or Get Screwed, How to Select the Best and Get the Most Out of Your Financial Advisor. Now, when you sign up for this free newsletter, uh, then when the new book comes out in uh, December, you'll be sent an opportunity to download that book at no cost. And if you like the work that you do, we will extract the cost from you at that moment of all the work we did for you, because the cost will be, you will turn in turn forward that free ebook to everybody you think might be helped by that book. Now, we do expect to sell a few books at Amazon and uh, we'll have a, 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 an audio book. Uh, Don McDonald, who is a, uh, a friend and an and investment ad, uh, advisor who's got a great, great radio voice and, mm-hmm. and he's going to read the book for the audio book. I am so excited about that, but I would just love to think there might be 100,000, 300,000. We just wrote an article a few weeks ago, uh, and we've had over 300,000 people open that article at MarketWatch. So we know it's possible. We just need your help getting it into the hands of the people that it will, in fact, help. We certainly hope. Here's one from somebody who says, I've looked at the tables to determine the risk tolerance an individual can handle for determining the stock bond allocation. I've used 120 minus my age to be more aggressive for determining stock allocation. And they're thinking about uh, wanting to know what would be a, a, a better strategy or formula for somebody who's going to be taking distributions of 4%. Do you have a favorite way of determining what that allocation should be between stocks and bonds? Daryl. Favorite way. Favorite way. Uh, No. Trustworthy. No. (laughs) That's helpful. In other words, anyone will do. Well, I think think what... 
it's, it's so individual, I think, is where I'm wrestling here, is are you more afraid about losing money? Are you worried about up and down volatility? You know, are you worried about whether your spouse is going to get upset and come and, you know, have it out with you and you need to do something different? You know, how, how concerned do you need to be about, about uh, running out of money, you know, uh, in terms of your, your withdrawal rate? Uh, it's, I hesitate to try to recommend one way over another without understanding more about the individual. I remember this question and at the time I wasn't sure whether he was asking how to determine the stock bond allocation or how to determine his withdrawal rate, their withdrawal rate. I think the stock bond allocation, for what, at least that's the way I, I read it. And I guess what I would do is look at the fine tuning table for the, for the portfolio that you're interested in. And keep in mind that, that the uh, withdrawal rates do not vary much between 70 and 30% equity allocations and just, you know, if you're really concerned about drawdowns, maybe you want 40% bonds. If you are more concerned about maybe leaving more to your heirs, maybe it's 60% equity. You know, when you look at those tables though, that you produce every year, and I look at the difference between one column and the next, an extra 10% in equities is huge over a lifetime, even, even, even when you look at that fine tuning table that you mentioned, that's available uh, at paulmerriman.com. When you look at that fine tuning table and you look at the difference between 40 and 50% equity in retirement and assuming you live to be 90, 95 years old and you retire at 60 or 65, Literally, an extra one tenth of one percent can mean a million dollars more. If, so, it, it, if if the person can stick with it, that, yes. that's that's the thing, right? So, yes, you know, I I think uh, you. <laughs> it's easy to look at the table and to think, oh yeah, I should take the maximum equity I can because I'm going to get the highest return. But it's really important to look at that drawdown piece, as Daryl said, because. If you're going to freak out when you're down 30%, you can't take a high equity position, right? You know, and, and it's a lot easier when you're not experiencing that drawdown to think you could do it than when you're actually seeing it. Because nobody tells you the day the market's down 30%, nobody tells you it's not going down any farther, right? Yeah. So yeah. you may have signed up for 30%, but you can't tell that it's not 40 and so it really, it really comes down to what your temperament is and can you stick with it? Right, another thing I think to remember too, and I remember this from one of Paul's uh, presentations when he was giving educational presentations, He's, when he would say, do you think you can handle 30% drawdown? And people go, yeah, yeah, I can handle that, no problem. Okay, you got a million dollars. So how do you feel about losing 300,000? Right. And they would go, oh, no, that's yeah. not good, you know. Well, it's the same thing, okay? <laughs> so I think you need to look at, at not only percentages, but you need to think about it in terms of how many dollars are you talking about going out the window here for a while. Right. So, and, and I think the other magic part is how much money you have relative to the what you have to take out. Uh, I don't know what that magic number is, but just if we assumed for a second that somebody had a million dollars and they needed to take out $40,000 a year to meet that cost of, of, of living above and beyond social security and whatever else they have, it would meet their, let's call it their needs. Now, if they had $2 million and, that, and but it didn't change their needs, and uh, at that point, there's a, you know, you're taking out instead of 4%, you're taking out 2% uh, to be able to, to uh, meet that $40,000 needs. Now, obviously, you can take out more, but just to look at the needs, at what point would you say to somebody, uh, and, and I think about this, I have friends who have all of their money in equities, every last cent in terms of long-term money in equities. They are retired. They also have a great pension. 
and they have social security and they're given money away rather than, than with the money they have coming in. They it meet way more than their cost of living. So what's wrong with the formula? If you have twice as much as you need, as an example, it, would it be okay to be 80% or 90% in equities? Or let's say instead of double, triple, you've got $3 million. Like somebody said here earlier, they have $3 million. What we don't know is how much they need to take out. And if they only need to take out a little, then maybe all equity is okay. I but think I think for oversavers, like you're describing, you know, people who have way more than they need, then a bucket strategy kind of makes sense, right? You can think about uh, having enough there that will bridge you for you know, one to five years of your living mm -hmm. expenses. And that lets you not have to sell when the market's down, right? Um, and for, for somebody who's got a million dollars, who's living off 40,000 though, five years is $200,000. I mean, you're, you're getting back to kind of traditional amounts of fixed income anyway in the portfolio. But mm -hmm. for somebody who's got three times as much money as they need, that's gonna put them in, you know, something like 10%, 5% of their, their assets are in fixed income. So I do think oversavers, people who have way more than they need, probably do think about that bucket strategy as a way to set their fixed income. Because, you know, if they end up with half of the money that they had in the market, they still have way more than they need to retire and they're not stressed yeah. about it, right? Um, also, people who have never seen our variable distribution tables, which are built for people who have oversaved, uh, boy, I hope they look at those because uh, the impact on uh, the future value of your investments when you are taking out even aggressive amounts. My wife and I take out 5%. I know people that take out 6%. They've oversaved and they're taking a variable distribution. Uh, my wife and I, the first week of each year, we take out 5% of whatever that portfolio is worth and that's it to live and give for a year. And uh, if the market goes up, then the next year we got more to live and give on. And, uh, uh, and if it goes down, we take a cut and pay. And it is amazing how having that defensive, reducing your distribution mm -hmm. during periods of market declines you will not believe if you haven't seen those tables how that helps protect your money for the rest of your life. And I'll just give one example. And you may remember this better than I, Daryl. I think about taking 5% out of the S&P 500, all equities, uh, going back to starting in 1970. And by, I think, the mid-80s or something, you're broke. You're broke if you adjusted it for inflation over the years. Take that same 5%, but make it variable. Take 5% of whatever it's worth when it goes up. Take 5% of what it's worth when it goes down. Not only do, does the money last for 50 years instead of 20 or something, um, uh, it leaves a pot full of money for your heirs just by being able to save enough extra that you can live on this variable distribution. You want to add anything on that, Daryl, since you put. Yeah, so the only thing I would, only thing I would think about, about variable in terms of it's a variable distribution is in terms of the amount of, of dollars that come out of it. It, it. It's a fixed percentage of your portfolio, but it's a variable amount of dollars. And so taking out a fixed percentage of your portfolio unadjusted for inflation, uh, that, that type of approach will never run out of money. The one thing you do need to remember is that if, if you do suffer a protracted bear market or drawdowns, like Paul mentioned, you can, you can, your withdrawals can get smaller than you may have had to begin with if you had, had looked at it at a lower but inflation adjusted scenario. And if you look at the tables and compare the two, you can see that. Yeah, yeah, well. I, I'll tell you, our followers really appreciate the work you do 
on producing those tables. It's uh, okay. This one, um, I've got to, I've got to answer it. I've got to answer it because I didn't know uh, at the time, but it was, it was my daughter who asked the question <laughs> at the AAII. She actually sat there and watched our presentation. But her question was, um, what is the most common mistake you see young first-time investors take make? Now, I think I passed that one to you at the time, Daryl. Uh, or maybe Chris, I don't know, I, but I, I gave an answer. You, you gave it. An and answer, and what, yeah. what did you say the, the biggest mistake is? I said the biggest mistake was learning the wrong lesson. So, you know, investing yeah. for a short period of time, you know, maybe they invest in the S and P 500, whatever, you know, maybe it's small value, maybe it's fixed income. And then after three months, six months, maybe a year, they look at it and they go, oh, well, that went down. I lost money. That was a stupid idea. I'm never doing that again, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think the problem with finance is that the lessons come on in decades, not months, not years. And so it's really hard to learn the right lesson. Um, I'm assuming, because the question was, what mistake can a young investor make, that they're already an investor? But I agree, a bigger mistake would be not investing. <laughs> Aha, but, absolutely. but if you do invest, yeah. learning the wrong lesson, I think, is a, is a big mistake a lot of people make. Yep. Daryl, what would you pick? I think, I think one, of the, one of the potentially biggest mistakes that a young investor can make is not taking enough risk. And that's, that's a little bit like uh, building off of what Chris said. But I think um, because especially when you're young, you work so hard for your money and you get your money, it's hard to let it go uh, and go work for yourself with the potential of losing it. But the thing that I think it's hard for younger people to remember is that you have an incredible amount of human capital left. You've got, you're, you've got a runway in front of you that is, that is, like Paul mentioned, decades long. You need to, to, I believe, you need to invest your money now and let it ride and, and don't worry about the day-to-day, year-to-year fluctuations, even multi-year fluctuations. You just keep socking it away. Keep socking it away as much as you can. Increase it as your, as your earnings increase um, and, and manage your portfolio that way. And do not worry over excessively if it goes down. Uh, because you have a lot of runway in front of you to earn it back. Uh, Chris has put together some very interesting charts, which I'm not sure if you're going to talk to them on the 23rd or if they're coming out in your book, Chris, about drawdowns in terms of the value of your portfolio when you're young compared to what you put into it. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a chance, I think younger investors should watch Chris's uh, presentation on the 21st to see that because it's very powerful. Uh, so, yeah, and they need to go to uh, aaii.com to, uh, to 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 register. It is free, and uh, it is evening at five thirty Pacific time. Uh, here is what I have concluded. I mean, Chris is right uh, that if you don't invest, that's that's the big mistake. But in the book about the, the 12 ways to supercharge your retirement, we're talking millions. I make this claim that if people do those 12 things, that literally each one of them is a million dollar plus outcome over a lifetime. Not looking to do that in years, but when you look at the, all those years of those years of taking money out to live on, and then that pile of whatever you got left over going to others, these 12 are each one legitimately worth a million dollars. And people say, well, does that mean you could have $12 million? Well, actually more than that. But, but yes, I do believe that. But they have to do the things. Then it's not about putting away a lot of money. It's about doing the right things with the money when you put it away. But in terms of dollars in our pockets for those young people, the biggest pile of extra money is going to come from the decision. And in a way, it, it, it's, it's what you said, Daryl, about risk. Be in equities. I don't mean equities for your whole life. 
but certainly equities, all equities for the first 20 or 25 years, and still even going into retirement, you should have a hefty amount of equities. Remember, the decision that these young people are making that's so wrong, I think, in terms of their make, they're putting money away, but they're refusing to put any money into equities. They don't trust equities. It's like going to Las Vegas. It's a gamble. It's not a gamble from everything we know about the past. You have to be patient, but it is an investment. The difference between the 5% that bonds paid over the last 90 plus years and the 10% that you would have gotten in the S&P 500 over that same period of time, that 5% People need to understand for every extra one half of 1% they get over the long term, it's worth an extra million plus over your lifetime. So if there are 5% implies to me there are 10 opportunities to pick up an extra million dollars if you go equities instead of fixed income for the long term. Again, I know you're not going to put it all in equities. So the question is, are you really saying, Mr. Merriman, that when I'm talking to high school kids or to college kids, that you would have that kind of extra money over a long period of time, including taking the money out? I mean, this is, this is not a short-term story. This is a long-term story. It's in essence, if we do this right and we have a newborn child in the family, you start an account right now as a part of that 100-year plan. But yes, yes, I think the biggest decision is taking equities over fixed income for the long term. That is going to be the biggest life changer of all. Now, there's 11 other items, which includes being tax smart and expense smart, uh, all of those things uh, that, that impact. And I do believe that Chris's two funds for life, that's a home run, is a home run if people will, will take a, a look at it. And I hope they'll go out to see Chris on the 21st. I, I'm, I'm going to be there and thrilled you're doing that, Chris. Um, I fully fund my 401k. I have more funny, <laughs> we have more money to invest. Should we? use that for my wife's 401k or put it in a taxable account. What say you gentlemen? I think that it's important to look ahead to when you're going to start taking the money out. It is possible to have too much in a tax deferred account because it can grow to the point to where when you have to take it out, you, your RMDs, you're taking a large amount out and RMDs are taxed at ordinary income rates, whatever your income is, in, including the RMD for that year. So you, this is getting into tax advice and, and everybody's different. So, but it's something you need to think about in terms of, of putting it into either, if you can't put it into a Roth, putting it into a taxable account instead of maybe a tax deferred account because gains come out of a taxable account only the gains are taxed out of a taxable account and they're taxed at the capital gains rate. And it's less, than, usually less than what your income tax rate is going to be. Um, but uh, you should definitely invest it somewhere. <laughs> don't leave, don't leave it go. I would just add to what you said, Daryl, that not, not only, um, you know, do you have that, the RMDs to worry about on the back end, right? The older you get, the more the RMDs matter, but you potentially will retire earlier than you planned. I did, you know, I always planned to work until I was 60 to 65. And if you retire earlier than you planned, well, now you're faced with having to pay penalties to take it out of the tax deferred accounts or taking it out of taxable accounts, right? And so the fact that we had Another level of diversification, account diversification, we had some money in taxable accounts too, that was part of our retirement savings, meant that we didn't have to worry about that. 
we didn't have to worry about the penalties. We were able to live off the money in the taxable accounts until we get to an age where we can access the tax deferred accounts without penalty. So I, 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 this is not your tax advice channel. We're, we're not experts in that regard by any stretch of the imagination. But I think uh, at least in our case, having tax diversification, having some in both kinds of accounts was really helpful. Yeah. Yes. I, I would um, add uh, that they might even want to take a look at those two 401k plans that they have access to and figure out who has the better asset class availability in those two 401k plans. And it may be that the fellow's spouse uh, has got better offerings than he has. So th that should be a consideration as, as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm, but I agree with what you, that, that, and the, that and the expenses of the different funds. And, and the, yes. And, yes. and any matches you get going into the different accounts, yes. right? You know, don't absolutely. miss out on the match. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. By the way, that is not one of the $12 million decisions, but it is a million dollar impact. Yeah. That match, I mean, that is, if, if, if I actually was looking for a job and I had two companies that, either one would do in terms of opportunity for the future. I'd want to be investigating their match and their 401k offerings because it can make a huge difference. I am reading a new book now about the fiduciary responsibility of people who run 401k plans. It is an outrage how many of those plans are run because they uh, have got the stocks or the funds they have in there or because that's what their buddy who works at a brokerage house recommended that they play golf with. And that's what their employees are ending up with as their investment choices. And uh, that's going to change. Uh, there are people getting in trouble nowadays for, for, for doing that. How patient should we be as we age in retirement and our available time gets shorter? Because everything is, he says, I agree that it does depend on your time horizon. So uh, uh, how patient should we be? That, um, that's, that's really a, a, a good question, uh, particularly when I happen to talk to somebody who's um, not very knowledgeable about investing, uh, they don't have very much money in retirement. They have maybe enough. So they're squeezed, take too little risk. They may not have enough, take too much risk. They panic. Um, what's the most do you think we should expose people in terms of time that somebody, something underperforms, because at the end of the day, the real benchmark for those of us who are in retirement is not whether we beat the S&P 500, it's whether we make a return that meets the needs of the portfolio we're counting on. So how patient, how would you, how would you quantify how patient a person should be ready to be? Well, if you're retired, I don't think patience is the first thing you ought to count on. Um, it depends on your time horizon, exactly as the questioner said. But if you retire at, at 65 and you've got 30 years in front of you, I don't think you can withstand 20 years of being patient to wait for your, your ship to come in in terms of, of returns on your portfolio. We saw earlier when you're looking at I think it was, was it the four fund or the small cap value? I don't remember, Paul, but um, I think it was, I think it was the four fund. The four fund outperformed or the, the S, sometimes it took the four fund 20 years to get back to even. Uh, and so I don't think that's, uh, this was for a hundred. By the way, I mean, to be, to be careful, not to break even in terms of a return, but to get the premium, that's on the, the telltale chart, I assume. Right. 
right. uh, to get the premium that you should have gotten for taking the extra risk. Right. Yes, that's a better way to put it. And, uh, and so in order to get that, it, it sometimes takes decades. And so when you're retired, I'm, if you have 30 years, I don't think waiting two thirds of that time to get the premium is probably a good thing, especially if that two thirds of that time happens to be the first two decades and you're taking money out at the same time. So I'm not sure patience is, a, is a, an attribute I would use in retirement. I think what you really need to do, in my opinion, is to set up your portfolio to be risk tolerant for what your risk tolerance is, and to be to be compatible with what your risk tolerance is, um, and that's probably includes more fixed income, less equities. Uh, you might add a little spice in there if you want a small cap value, if but but be cognizant of the effect that that may not pay off over your time horizon. Uh, so, so Daryl and, and Chris, what do you, what do you think people believe about their investments? Do you think somebody who's got a 50, 50 stock bond portfolio understands they're sitting on a powder keg and that could go down about 25%. Do you think people who are 50, 50 and in retirement, who somebody didn't explain that's the, in, the risk that they're taking. You think retired people are ready to lose 25% of their money? Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say uh, retired investors are accruing investors who are at the end of their life or in the second half of their life, right? Yeah. So they've probably lived through a lot of what they're invested in already. Um, I think there's a huge amount of momentum Right. You mentioned investors who are all equity in retirement. I, I think a lot of them think of it as what got them there, right? Got me to retire. It was good enough for my years of accruing. Why would I change now? Um, so I, I, I worry more about young investors being not acclimated to the risk that they're taking uh, than I do old investors, because, because I think a lot of older investors have you know, they've, they've experienced things. They've been through something before, right? Mm -hmm. um, do they fully appreciate the risk they're taking? I would say no. And the reason I say no is that, uh, you know, we can only back test to 1970 for most of what we do, right? And sometimes we have a discussion about, well, you know, it's reasonable not to go back to 1928 because that'll never happen again, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that was just, that was like a young country off the rails, didn't know how to manage its monetary policy, right? All these problems. If you go back to 1928, the risks get a lot bigger. And so I think a lot of people are thinking about their risk in terms of their lifetime of experience. And they may be underestimating the corner case once in a hundred years thing that could happen. Um, and I, I think about that a lot of the time when I think about my own finances is that, you know, those one in a hundred years things, they're really hard to characterize and say how likely or unlikely they are within your lifetime. So I, I would say most people probably underestimate the risk because they base it too much on their recency bias, where I'm going to say recency is your lifetime, right? It's what you've experienced so far. Daryl, do you agree or disagree? No, I, I agree. I think it, an interesting read, if you want to, if you want to think about uh, once in a lifetime risks or, or, or things like that is, is Bill Bernstein's book on deep risks. Uh -huh. deep risk. um, it's very enlightening and slightly terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've not read that book, Daryl. Um, I, I, I need to, I, I love being scared. Uh, It'll work for you. It'll work. So, so how important in that book is massive diversification and how, how massive does it become? Um, the kinds of things that he talks about, I don't, diversification is not going to save you. I see. Um, because the kinds of things he talks about are confiscation, for example, by the government. Um, I don't remember the other ones right offhand, but, but they're, they're really existential portfolio, existential risks and, uh, things that you really don't have much control over. Uh, 
so, but, but what it helps is, I think it helps set your level that, you know, there are things out there that I cannot control that can do me in. So maybe the bad things that I might be able to have some control over, I ought to take a little more seriously and try to mitigate those. Uh, at least that's what it had. That's the effect it had on me anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is difficult when you, when you think long term, I have no idea whether we'll be around in 2000 years, humans, but, but with high school kids, I always enjoy asking them what a piece of bubble gum will cost in 2000 years. And, uh, and I don't, they don't know where I'm going with this, but when we were, when I was a kid, it was a penny for a people, a piece of bubble gum. And now it, it appears it can be a, be a dime for a piece of bubble gum. But I asked them at 3% inflation rate, which in a sense, Chris, you're talking about recency bias. We all know that since 1928, inflation has been 3%. So if that's normal, and we should be using that in our planning, then how much will a five cent piece of bubble gum cost in 2000 years at 3% inflation? Now, I don't know how to deal with the answer, but it's $2.3 trillion billion. What do we do with that? What does that say about what our society will be like? And then I tell the kids that at plus it will be a smaller piece of gum. But, you know, it is, it is when you think long term, the kinds of things that we believe in become kind of hard to figure out how that's going to work. But then I think what we do, just like people do with the debt of our nation, they think, well, somebody else will take care of that. Or, or bubblegum will be free, whatever, whatever the answer is. So uh, it, it, it is an interesting challenge. I think that makes the point about your book about we're talking millions more to the oh. point is that because you might need millions. To, oh, exactly. Because those are nominal dollars and, yep. and you might need millions to fund your retirement. Absolutely. A million Absolutely. isn't what it used to be. So I know we're down to the last question and I know we left 50 questions on the table and, I, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, unfortunately, we have so many other projects that we can't keep doing these for AAII, but it's been fun doing them. We did have a question here about recommended books for people. And, uh, and Daryl, you put one on the, the table. Do you have a, a couple more that you think that uh, uh, an old timer or a new timer uh, might have that, that, uh, uh, that you would recommend? Well, I, I have two right offhand. Good. One is Bogle's book on common sense investing. This is yep. an incredible, it's not very thick. It's, and, it, and, it's, and it's easily, it, it, I mean, it's big type on, on small pages and it's e you can easily read this in a couple hours. And it's very useful. It's very good, good to provide context. The other one is if you're a little older and you're a little more uh, nerdy, if you will, um, Bill Bengen's book, it's, it's probably 20 years old by now, but on, on how to conserve your portfolio in retirement is a really good introduction to withdrawal rates in portfolio in, in retirement portfolios. Uh, it's old, it's, it's, but the numbers and the process haven't changed that much. People are now arguing about details that, you know, is it, is it really still applicable? Is it really 3.8 or 3.5 or is it 4.2? You know, is three the new four? You Great. should read the book and understand what's behind it. And, and uh, in fact, Michael Kitsis also has some, some good studies on safe withdrawal rates, uh, his website. Uh, so those are two things that I would. That's great. Thank you. Chris. I, I just grabbed two off my shelf. Um, I, I really like a random walk down Wall Street as just kind of a starting point to let you know nobody knows the future, right? And um, I, I think it's just got, a, it's full of a lot of common sense 
And then uh, my wonky example, if you want to get into factor investing or understand like why the tilt's small, why the tilt's value makes sense, uh, I would go with um, Swedro and Bankin's book here, uh, which is your complete guide to factor-based investing. Um, definitely more on the technical side of things. And um, I, I think, I, I think it's a good, it's a, if you want to know why, if you want to know why the tilts of small and value work and why maybe other factors are interesting to look at too, I would look at that. Uh, if you want to know why we don't tilt to all of the other factors of momentum and low volatility, that's a longer conversation, but um, we can follow that up later. Yeah. Great. There was one other one and that's, that's Charles Ellis's book, Winning the yeah. Loser's Game. Terrific. This is, a, this is an excellent book. It's also not very long. It has smaller type on bigger pages, so it'll take a little longer to read, but it's still yeah. a good read. <laughs> Spoken as an engineer. Uh, the uh, uh, Jason Zweig's uh, Your Money and Your Brain. That's a good one. I've read it. I, I've read it probably 10 times, uh, only because I've used his work in when I was doing uh, workshops, uh, all day workshops. I uh, he just has so much good stuff in there, and it's been around for years. Daryl, you had another book that it was a on the emotional side that you had recommended uh, that you thought was pretty good. You don't remember what it was, okay? I don't remember right offhand. Uh, and I also am a great uh, uh, Bogle fan. I mentioned successful and secure retirement. There are so many aspects of planning covered in this book that uh, I I think it will be a a great starting point before you go to meet with an investment advisor, if you're going to do that, because, because if you're not getting as much good stuff out of it as you got out of Swedro's book, it probably means you need to look for a different advisor. Um, I'm going to mention too, a very good friend. In fact, a fellow board member uh, of our uh, foundation, um, Paul Hayes, has written what I think is a terrific uh, book. Uh, it's, it's probably a gift to a younger, somebody in their 20s, but it's called Spending Your Way to Wealth. And um, it is, I, I think, a, a focus on the saving aspect and how important that, that saving is. There's lots of good stuff about investing in there, but how do we get the mindset to be a, 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 a really good, uh, a good saver? And uh, Paul makes the point that, uh, that uh, spending or saving is really spending. That's what it's really all about. It's still uh, about spending when you save. It's just spending later. And uh, the big hey, challenge... Paul. Since this is going out to the AAII as well as your uh, podcast listeners, if there's anybody in the AAII who wants to hear the interview you did with Paul Hayes on right. his book, um, yeah. that's in your podcast feed. And I think if, you know, if you're just curious about the book, you can go listen to it. It's a yes. really nice interview. You get a lot of the philosophy and then you can decide whether it's your cup of tea or not. Yeah, That's terrific. Yes. In fact, we'll put a link to that uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the notes for, for this, uh, uh, for this podcast and this, um, YouTube. Well, uh, I think we have, um, we filled our hour. We were hopefully helpful. Plus you guys are just, I'm, I'm not kidding. You guys are terrific. And I just, I want people to know that they didn't know some of these questions were coming to today. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, they did know some of them because we've talked about them, but uh, they're fast on their feet and they've got, uh, they're good problem solvers. So I want to thank, thank Chris and Daryl so much for all of their help and uh, keep coming back. We'll do what we can to help. You can help us by bringing us new eyeballs and new ears we, we certainly want to get our message to as many people as we possibly can. We are a non-profit organization. We are, we are here for one purpose, and that is to do, help people do with their money what's best for them and their money. We are not 
we are not concerned about feathering anybody else's nest. So uh, uh, appreciate your help in getting people to know about our work. Thank you, guys.